After his court case ended in December of 2009, Gotti returned to his home in the fashionable village of Oyster Bay, Long Island. At age 47, he is married with six children, ranging in age from 4 to 20, and he is now trying to acclimate himself to being a free man. Even though he claims he is no longer part of the mafia, or the life as he calls it, there are things about being a gangster that he misses. The story will continue in a moment. I was in the life. I was active in the life. Um, I embraced the life and everything that went with it. But a lot of what you've heard and seen about me is fiction. There's fact and there's fiction, and a lot of it is fiction. Was there anything about the life other than your father that you liked and enjoyed? There's a lot to like about the streets. There's a lot of glamour there. You know, there's a lot of uh, what you believe to be camaraderie. Uh, you know, there's a lot there. There's a lot there, believe me. It's, uh, it's appealing. It was, I found it appealing. The glamour part. Tell me about the glamour part. Well, there's the suits. There's the cars. Uh, there's the restaurants. There's the attention. The deference you're given, no matter where you go. Uh, you know. It means a lot. You feel like you're a special kind of guy. When you uh, got into the life, and particularly after your, your father went, uh, went away, were you accepted by the other people? Accepted? I was born there. Mm -hmm. I was running around the club as a, as a kid. I was born there. That's where I belonged, as far as most people were concerned. I've, the people that... Uh, I'd read newspapers and read negative things about them. Uh, this one, the hatchet, or whatever nicknames they were given by the media, I don't know who they were. I would call them Uncle Tony or Uncle Bill or Uncle Tom. You know, I, I, I knew them since I was a baby, for crying out, since I was a child running around. You know, it's, it was very natural. Mm -hmm. It's very natural. You still live by the code of the street? No. No. I'm more open minded in regards to a lot of different things. I mean, you know, the old me, uh, my wife wasn't permitted to get on the phone and talk business with a guy, for crying out loud. If she had to call up the exterminator and it was a guy, I would, would have told him in the past, uh, doesn't he have a secretary you could talk to? What do you have to get on the phone with a guy for? There's no need for this. No, don't do it again. That's the old me. Now, that's old school. That's old school, and that's the way I was raised. Today, Gotti is a free man and back living in his family's two-acre compound with a swimming pool and stables. It's a very nice piece of property. Thank you. He claims the property was purchased with income from legitimate businesses, and the government has been unable to prove otherwise. He says it's heavily mortgaged, and he is deeply in debt after spending millions on his legal bills. He says the family is getting by on a modest income from commercial real estate properties. This little guy was born the first day of jury selection in my third trial. And even though his case has ended, Gotti says the media still shows up unannounced to get pictures of him walking around his property. I still get photographers, reporters around? All the time. All the time. Sure, usually, uh, usually you hide right behind that bush over there. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I gotta be very careful how I walk around my property. <laughs> God forbid my bathroom opens up a little bit, and that's an indecent exposure pinch. He wouldn't let our cameras film in his house, with one exception. This is my Indian room. Indian room? That's what I call it, the Indian room. This is, this is a humidor. Wow. Yeah, this is old. This is the Chiefs, Sitting Bull, Red Cloud, Chief Joseph, Eminent Crow. And why the fascination? Why, why do you like uh, Native Americans so much? I love their struggle. I love the plight. I love the fact that they... Uh, they, they never gave up hope. And the oppression. The oppression means a lot to me. It's wonderful. Gotti says he went through his own ordeal three years ago when the FBI came to his house to arrest him on the case that he had been acquitted of. Tell me about the day you were arrested. August 5th, 2008. Yeah. I was home. My son Joe was sick. I was up with him all night. And uh, I finally got him to sleep around 5.30, 20 to 6. I went in the bathroom, I was washing up. I heard the dog barking. My German Shepherd Rocky, he passed on while I was in. And uh, I figured it was my brother coming home. And I said, you know, I'll fix my brother later on about walking in the house this late. But the dog kept on going, the bark kept on going. 
And I realized that it was more than just that. So I went to the, before I even got to the window, I told my wife, I said, get up, they're here for me. She says, no, no, I said, they're here for me, they're here, get up, they're here for me. Couldn't believe it. we got up, looked out the window, and they were coming from every angle. They were coming over the fences, down the driveway, every angle. How did, how did the family react? Well, that morning, what I did was, naturally let the agents in the house, took me to my bathroom, where I had to strip naked, and they had to watch me get dressed. Uh, and I remember walking out of the bedroom, the master bedroom, and the baby was in a fetal position, laying on a bed. He wasn't asleep, he was up. His eyes were open, he was watching me, being led from that room with all the agents around me. My wife had gathered all my kids up and had them downstairs because I wanted to see them, I want them to see me off. And when I got down to the bottom of the stairs, my daughter pretty much took it hard. She basically, uh, you know, she was throwing the agents out, you know, what do you want from him? You know, get out, that's it. You know, I can't take no more of this. You gotta leave him alone. And I, I had to calm my daughter down. I had to make her understand that I'm gonna be okay. Daddy will be fine, don't worry about it. Daddy will always be okay. But it was hard for a kid to accept. But being a tough guy on the streets was no preparation for raising a teenage daughter at home. You a strict father? It's not easy to be a father of an 18-year-old daughter. Notice I threw daughter in. Son, I can somewhat grab him by the arm and say, come here, let me tell you something. Let me read you the riot act. Daughter, what do you do? I don't know what to do. I can't grab Buddy Armory to riot act, so I look at her and she tells me, she says, mind your own business. If a guy told me that, I wouldn't have taken a backward step. So I guess my parenting skills leave a lot to be desired in that respect. What do you think it's like for the boys that are going out with your daughter? She doesn't have any boyfriends. So it's people not, are afraid to ask her out. It's, it's, it's awkward, and my daughter says she keeps blaming it on me. Me? Hey, what did I do wrong? I just got here. What did I do wrong? She says, well, it's the reputation, they read the newspapers. Sweetie, I can't help that. I don't print those newspapers. I don't know what to tell you. I don't know what you want me to do. I says, I don't know what I can do differently. She says, you know, I'll, if you want to make you happy, I'll put a pink bunny costume on and I'll hop around the yard. What do you want me to do? I don't know what to tell you. What, what I can do for you. There are reasons to not want to get in trouble with his family, cross his family. Maybe in the past, for what we were, yeah. Now, yeah, you had to treat the women in our family a certain way, okay? I would never disrespect a man's daughter. I expect the same. That's the way it has to be. And if you don't, well, then you'll see a side of me that you hoped you never saw. So you have this other side? Yeah, I do. I do. I was never known to take a backward step and throw in his hands. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think that's changed. I still got my temper, unfortunately. Were you a tough guy? Was I a tough guy? I thought I was. I thought it was pretty good. Uh, I had a reputation in the neighborhood. I was good with my hands, very good with my hands. I had a, my, my father's temper, I would guess, yeah, sure. So people didn't really want to mess with you very much? I guess for multiple reasons. A, you knew you were going to get into a fight. I was going to fight. That's it. I wasn't taking a backward step to anybody. And B, because I guess my father, my uncles, the name, uh, you know, one time when I was a kid, we went to a nightclub and we got into a fight. And there was, I think, three or four of us, and there was about eight or nine kids on the opposing team. And the bouncers just so happened to have been their friends. And we got, we got dealt a bad decision. I mean, we got banged up pretty good. And I sounded the retreat and we took off. We took off a running. And I remember being sent for. And my Uncle Angelo sends for me, Angelo Ruggiero sends for me. And, uh, he says, uh, come on. He says, uh, he's got his son in the car. He says, get in the car. And I see his son, and he's like this in the car, frozen. I said, uh-oh, this can't be good. We have a problem here. And he gets me in the back seat of the car, and he brings me to the Bergen Hunt and Fish Club. He says, get inside. And we walk inside. As soon as we walk inside, they gave it to us. And we were getting cracks, and we were getting slaps and everything. And I just didn't understand why. And then at the end... My father turns and looks at me and says, you don't ever take a backward step. You don't ever retreat. You understand me? You get into a situation like that, you leave it there or let them leave you there. That's the way it works. And I looked at him like, you know, I wanted to say, you know, I'm your son. But as far as he was concerned, he took it personal. You know, I'm his son and I'm affiliated with him and the Bergen crew and nobody affiliated with us is taking a backward step. So now you know for the future, you got a choice. 
you fight until you can't fight no more, or you come back here and you deal with us. That's the way it's going to work out. Mm -hmm. But Gotti says not all of his father's lessons were about fighting. And he told us this one about dancing. He always lo loved to watch other people dance. So he'd say, hey, John, come on, go up there and dance. You know, your mom and I can't dance, but you go ahead and dance. I said, I'm not going to dance that. I'm not going nah, to dance. I'm not going to dance. So he told my wife, he says, Kim, go ahead, go dance. Go dance. So she looks at me, like, is it okay if I go dance? And I go like this to her, like, no, don't go dance. So he, my father caught the move, and he didn't press it any further. Afterwards, he pulls me off to the side, never to embarrass me. That's the kind of guy he was, he wouldn't embarrass me. He pulled me off to the side, and he says, what's that all about? I said, I don't want my wife dancing in a, in a nightclub. He says, uh, hey, John, let me tell you something, he says. At the end of the day, all we're going to have is memories. That's it. And you've got to make as many as you can. That's all you're going to have. You understand me? And I looked at him. I said, yeah, it's okay. I hope you understand me. And that was it. And I understood it. Mm -hmm. So now I, I understood even more clearly later on what he was saying. And I always tell the story to people. I always say, you know, that's the way he was. You've got to make memories. Gotti says he's explored the possibility of leaving the New York area for North Carolina or Florida, but some of his children are resisting. He says he's interested in writing a book about his life. Okay. I, uh, I've been writing for several years, um, exploring a literary career. You wrote a children's book? I did. I did. While I was in Ray Brook, sure. Fun. It was fun because the, the, the fact that I, I, I had written it, and my cellmate, who was doing 17 years for bank robbery, Brian Lindemann, sweetheart of a kid, uh, he was, uh, he's somewhat of an artist. So he did all the illustrations, and I couldn't get it published. I couldn't get it published because everywhere we went, they wanted my life. Now, we want to know about the juicy stuff, and, and then we'll do that. And I wasn't interested in doing it, so basically went nowhere. The next one, he hopes, will be more commercial but don't expect him to badmouth the mob or the people who were loyal to him or his father. They know where he lives, and he says they were happy to let him go, just like he knew they would. It's more money for them. I'm blessed. Blessed. Why do you feel that way? You're alive. I'm alive. I'm free. My children are healthy, which is most important. I have the liberty to get up every morning and embrace my children, spend time with my family. I'm blessed. If tomorrow morning I walked in, saw an oncologist, and he told me you have terminal cancer, I'm ahead of the game. I can't complain. I won't complain.